Hey everyone, uh, Steven again. Uh, we just finished Town Time in the City of Nod. Uh, a great session. I just had a lot of fun. Uh, again, this was my, my prep. <laughs> so much nothing. Uh, but it ended up being so much fun. Um, I'm going to talk about what the players did first that really surprised me and was really amazing. Rasper, when he said, I'm going to go off on my own, that is like one of the scariest things a player can say, like the sort of morally amb ambiguous player saying, I'm going to go off on my own. So it's like, oh God, no, here we go. Now we're going to have like a duplicitous character keeping stuff from the party. But um, Rasper and, and Josh at the end of the day are totally team players. And he doesn't want to get this information to keep it from the rest of them. You know, he like turned around and said, look, Val, look what I found. You know, I was expecting us to like to keep that a secret for a long time, but great on Josh because now that was the gift that kept giving because the party was able to talk about um, some of these mysteries that are now starting to get some answers, like what caused uh, Yunzi's sickening, si stiffening sickness um, or stiphilis. Um, and you, it, it just gave a lot of this other side to the, to the city. Um, so that was kind of the gift that kept on giving. And I, I ended up, we of course had the big discussion about whether or not Nottish Steel is going to be able to be found. Um, so, and there's a forger guy, but it's kind of a morally ambiguous thing. I don't want them to just be able to like buy it willy-nilly, like just give some artisan some money that he's going to be happy with. Uh, and he's gonna be like, oh, thank you very much for this for your patronage. I don't want it to be that easy. So this was a way of giving them a way to do it, because otherwise they were just gonna keep looking for it. But you know, it's gonna cost them their souls um, rather than coin. Um, so a little bit of an added cost to that. Um, let's see. Um, oh, Vel. Vel met. Um, oh, the the tour was great. It let me kind of just talk about the city uh, and sort of. I presented them, they don't know it yet, but I presented them with a bunch of objectives or really a bunch of important things that need to be protected. The Pentagon, the Aqueduct, and that tour guide was great because I was basically able to just list off these things that are now going to be targets for our villain, um, Osilax, who is um, an orcish, um, he practices what the orcs call the art. Uh, and it's essentially blood magic, which is, oh, he's a wild magic sorcerer. Um, and he has an awesome backstory, which I think we will get into probably next session. Um, and I think, uh, no, he's not on the, I, I have, I'll put, I'll put his, him up on the, on the wiki if you guys want to look at his backstory. Uh, but we are going to be addressing it in the show because he's going to be um, our bad guy for a little while. And there's a bunch of targets that I set up that he's going to start attacking. Um, uh, I'll just list, well, um, hopefully I didn't spoil that for any of my players if you're, if you're watching my afterwards. Um, I won't say what they are now, um, but... So yeah, he's he's a villain that I'm really excited about, because um, he's not a hundred percent he's not a hundred percent a bad guy. Um, so yeah, he was fun to set up, and I'm glad that Vel got to talk to him a little bit. I'm glad we got the poison. Uh, we had a great Christine Clarion moment. Great on Clarion for reaching out to Christine. Um, because that's, you know, a lot of the time the players are all role-playing in their heads, but the greatest asset is when they role-play off of each other. Because, you know, it's it's them building rather than just individual players playing with me. Like, you know, they're opening their character conversation. So the next time that something comes up, Clarion and uh, Christine are both going to remember this conversation they had. And it strengthens their bond. Um, about, I should have talked about this in the last afterwards, but I'll talk about it in this one. The, uh, the Jamie, uh, Clarion seat flip, um, there was a specific reason for that. And that is because, uh, Jamie, Christine, and Rasper have all spent the last year and a half in Marenton together, basically as all part of the administration of Marenton. Um, and so they have been together in that setting for longer than all the other events of Threshold combined. And so they have a really tight relationship, and I wanted to sort of create um, geographical closeness to sort of let them interact, and so they're all on the same camera. Um, 
And that actually worked, uh, I think, really well. They were sort of able to talk to each other and joke with each other some more. Um, I do. I'm, I think we're gonna miss some of the Jamie Bell banter here, but um, I think it'll also sort of put the banter more on that end of the table where the characters would would do that because of the way that their bond is. Um, Oh, let's see, what else? Uh, the tournament, I was originally gonna have them all fight in the tournament, but um, I had thought about doing that, but it was like, no, let's just set it up as a red herring. Uh, I'm sure they were wondering like, wow, we're getting pretty close to the clock here. I wonder I wonder how this tournament is gonna go, and then explosion. Uh, oh, Jamie has a, a new patron who's courting him. Uh, he is a patron that we have seen before. Uh, or at least heard from before. And so he already kind of has his feelers out in the world. Um, and we'll see exactly what he's up to over the season. I want to give Brian his spells back, but I want him to earn them. Um, not that he ever really did anything to lose them, but it's going to be so much more satisfying the longer I let him sort of not be powered. So when he does get his powers back, you know, as his, like, sixth level warlock or whatever it's going to be by that point, it's going to be massively awesome. Um, Reno. Yes. So, uh, thank you, Eric. So, uh, world building and Reno, you know, there was some comments during our questions, comments, concerns for our session um, in which people started saying, like, talking about what made the city feel different and like sort of wanting to go there. And it reminded me that uh, I'm, I grew up in Reno, Nevada. And when I go to Reno, um, there are of course people that I want to see and things that I want to do. But a lot of the things that I find myself as I get older wanting to do is there's restaurants that I want to eat at. Like it's, oh, you know, I want to go to the Awful Awful or I want to go to, I, I want to go to India Garden or I want to go try this, you know, this new place in Midtown or something like that. And... I think that that's true in a lot of cities, is that the things that make the city aren't like the big things that you know you want to do. Like you go to a new place and like when you travel around Europe, you go to all these touristy places when you go to these big cities and you go to the Eiffel Tower and you go to all this stuff, but that's not what the locals do there. And that's not what sort of gives a city its vibe. You got to have a couple of big monuments to sort of give it a unique skyline so that it's going to be uh, discernible and interesting, but then um, the other thing that you have to sort of think about is like, what are the little details? Like, what do people eat? Like, lizards on a stick. Lizard is my my go-to thing to make a place feel foreign because uh, it's something that we don't eat. But you could totally see someone eating. Like, a lizard is not the grossest thing on the planet. It's not like uh, it's not like bugs. Like that's super foreign. But lizard is like, oh, I could, I would probably try roast lizard if someone handed it to me. Or snake. I could have done snake. Ah, I messed up. Um, but um, yeah, you just. I like to think about sort of the little, uh, the little differences, particularly in what kind of shops you go to, uh, like. Um, Vel said, in Easterton, he'll think fondly of it because there's a Moran bread bowl place that he likes to eat at. Or um, here there's, there's lizards on a stick and there's, um, you know, there's the, they'll always think about the tour that they took and the little rickshaw cart. Um, so maybe when you're trying to build a new city to make it feel new, unique, rather than thinking about like, oh, what is, you know, what's the law or what's the government type? Because neither of those things were touched on at all. Uh, but I think that it's much better to build from a sort of like detail, like think about what are your players going to actually do there unless they're going to be meeting the king. I don't know. Is it a king of Nod? It's, um, it's probably my something. Um, but uh, it's, it's not really un conducive unless someone's going to list, well, this is a theocracy with a wizard at the top. Um, who worships this, you know, that's not going to make the city feel any different. What's going to make it feel different are the little details. And think about, like, what you show people when you go around to your, to your hometown once you've, like, checked off the big, the big things to see there. Like, once I've taken someone to downtown Reno, it's like, well, you have to eat at the Awful Awful, and you have to walk through the creepy alley to get to the back, like, so you can get into this place, like, through this dark alley. Uh, and that's what... Uh, makes a, a place 
feel like home is the little details. Um, and I just realized that listening to them talk about it. And so that's a pretty fun insight for making a place feel different is look for the little in, inconsequential details that will add to the flavor rather than, you know, a huge map and you know how many artisans there are. Um, so um, next time uh, we'll see the after, I, we'll probably start in media res in the middle of this aftermath um, in the middle of the chaos. Uh, and we'll see what happens. I'm very excited. You should be too. Uh, have a great weekend, and we'll see you on Monday.